in sustainable agriculture and the broader environment and river health in the Lower Blackwood catchment. You can find out more about us and the work we do on our website, www.lowerblackwood.com.au. I'd also like to take the opportunity to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which we all live and work. I acknowledge the Wadandi Pibbleman people of the Bibbulmun Nation and pay our respects to elders past, present and future. Before we get to our lovely presenter, just a few words on how the webinar will run today. You may have noticed by now that you can hear, uh, hear me but not speak yourself. That's deliberate so we can keep things moving along at a good pace. You can definitely still ask questions though. In fact, this web webinar has been designed specifically to allow a substantial amount of time for questions. So please don't be shy. Um, just type your question uh, at any time into the chat box and I'll make sure it gets asked at the end of the presentation. Also, if you run into any technical difficulties, please use the status button. Uh, it's the hand you see at the bottom right hand of the, your screen to let me know and I'll see if I can fix it at our end. Don't worry though, if you have to leave early or drop out for whatever reason, we will be recording this session, uh, which I will email out to you all next week, along with the PDF of Christine's presentation. Okay, to the reason you have all tuned in, I have great pleasure in introducing our presenter today, the internationally renowned and highly respected ground cover and soils ecologist, Dr. Christine Jones. As many of you will know, Christine has a huge wealth of experience working with landholders to implement regenerative land manage management practices globally. And actually, since our last webinar with Christine in July, she has virtually been touring the world <laughs> uh, on an exhausting schedule of webinars from New Zealand to Namibia, Namibia uh, to Ireland and more, she tells me. So we are delighted that Christine is able to join us today in almost the same time zone uh, as her. <laughs> So welcome, Christine. Thank you very much, Kate. And uh, it is a great pleasure to be here. Lovely to be in Australia. And as you said, almost in the same time zone, much more comfortable than working at four o'clock in the morning or something. Uh, so today we're going to be talking about the fundamentals of agricultural soils. This is my second webinar with the Lower Blackwood Landcare Group. So thank you very much for having me back. And, um, and it's really interesting to see all the, the questions that we've received from the first webinar. So today we thought we'd allow plenty of time for questions, but there is also a lot of, uh, I mean, there is so much material that I'd love to cover. So we're going to try and have it so that it's half, I'm going to speak for about 40 minutes um, on some things that I think will be helpful. And, um, and then we're going to open it up to, to questions. So of course, as Kate mentioned, you can type your questions into the chat function at any time. Um, so we haven't got much time, speaking of time, so we're going to get underway. Uh, so the fundamentals of agricultural source, and one of the things that comes up uh, in all parts of the world really is about, there, there is obviously a need to change the way we grow our food and fibre. In, uh, and we need to uh, produce things in a way that is going to uh, regenerate soils, but also to regenerate farm profit. And I think probably this has been one of the key motivational factors for, for people wanting to change uh, is the fact that there isn't much profit in farming anymore. And also we don't have resilience um, to the climatic extremes that we're seeing. So there's a lot of very good reasons to, to change. So just very quickly before I get on to the um, to the biology and the microbiology, I just want to say something about farm profit um, because this situation occurs, um, this is like worldwide, everybody's in the same same boat, Every everyone in agriculture is in the same boat regarding profitability. Um, I can't actually see that slide for some reason, that's not loading. Can you see that, Kate? Is she there? I can't see my next slide taking an awfully long time. Are you there, Kate? Maybe she went to make a cup of tea. Well, I don't know what's going on, folks, but I can't actually, let me just go back and see why can't I see that next one. I can't see anything. I'll have to call her. No, where is Kate? 
Okay. Well, I don't know what happened there. Let's see what happens here. Oh, here we go. Oh, we did it without Kate. All right, well, we missed the first couple of slides, but that doesn't matter. This was the one I wanted to show you. So a picture tells a thousand words. So this is Canadian net farm income data, but exactly the same thing has been happening in Australia. So this is 80 years of data from 1926 over here on the left-hand side to 2016 here on the right. So in that 80 year period, I hope you can see my pointer here in this blue area. So this blue line here, or this top line is gross uh, agricultural revenue. So all of the income that's earned from agricultural industries is in that blue area. The green line is net farm income. So for a certain period in the early 1900s, net farm income was following gross farm production, which is what you'd expect in the years when commodity prices were low or seasons were unfavorable and the gross value of agricultural production fell then net farm income fell. And in good years, when the gross value of agricultural production rose, net farm income rose. So we'd actually like to see this green line very close to the blue line. Um, in, and look, look at what's happening over here. So here around about 1970, the blue line, the trend is still up, even though it goes up and down with seasons and commodity prices, but the green line has gone down. And where we have this um, red area here in about 2006, was when the cost of producing corn was more than what farmers received for their corn. And that's probably something that's very familiar in Australia to, uh, to various industries that's happened over time with, uh, with beef and, and wool and wheat uh, and other commodities. In some years, the cost of, actually, uh, cost of production is actually higher than, um, than the return. So this blue area here, what's going on here? Um, what, what was found in this analysis was that, if I click on the right thing here, was that, um, oh, I hope you can see that because I can't. I don't know why this is taking so long to load. We tried this, we had a, um, a trial with this this afternoon. We had no problems with it at all. Anyway, uh, I can't see anything there, so I hope you can. But what, <laughs> what was found in this trial was that, uh, in the last 30 years from, I think from 1986 to 2016, the uh, input providers, in other words, the people who provided, you know, the tractors and the, and the seed and the fertiliser and, um, you know, the bankers who provide money and all of the input providers for agriculture, their uh, returns were 98%. So they took 98% of gross farm income I just wish I could show, oh, there we go. <laughs> I don't know, I hope this is not going to continue like this for the rest of the evening. Uh, so that big blue area is actually going, they received 1.32 trillion of the 1.35 trillion of agricultural production. So input providers are doing very nicely, thank you very much, out of agriculture and farmers are not. Um, so farm debt in Canada is now at a record high and farm debt in Australia is also at a record high. So if we look at farm debt, it's just going up, up and up. And there was a little bit of a dip here when we had some reasonable rainfall in um, 2010, 2011, and actually were able to produce some crops in Eastern Australia. But then when we went into another um, dry period, farm debt has gone up again. So if we just look at Western Australia, and just to take one commodity, for example, the average wheat yield in Western Australia doubled between 19... 80 in the year 2000, in that 20 year period, we had doubling of wheat yields and farmers profits halved over the same period. So it isn't about increasing yield. We're repeatedly told that we need to produce more to get out of this mess. Um, but what we have to do is optimize profit. So we have to look very closely at inputs. What, what are the inputs? What, what purpose are they serving? Are they really, um, are they really helping us to optimise profit, all the things that we are spending money on in farming. So how are we going to go about optimising profit? If it's not about maximising yield, what is it actually about? Well, it's about regenerating the resource base. We have to have more carbon in our soils so that we have good structure and so that we have nutrient availability and, uh, and water holding capacity. 
And all of those things are really fundamental to profit. It's not about inputs, it's about getting our basics right. Um, and that means that what we have to do is to look at uh, microbial mediation of all of the processes that we want. So 85 to 90% of plant nutrient acquisition is microbially mediated. In other words, the nutrients that get into plants get there through the microbe, the plant microbe bridge. Um, it's not, the nutrients don't have to come from a bag. We don't have to go out and buy those things. And one of the issues with going out and buying those things is that what we are doing is actually blowing the plant microbe bridge. We are interfering with the natural relationship between plants so that they would be able to get those nutrients um, under normal circumstances. So how can we restore that plant microbe bridge? How can we get our microbes working for us? How can we actually get our plants working for us? If we're just pouring fertilizer onto them, we're making incredibly lazy plants and they're, and they're not working. I mean, anybody, if you if you give any, any living thing an excess um, to its requirements and it doesn't have to do anything, well, it won't. Um, plants are lazy too. So you know, if we just keep pouring on the fertilizer, they're not gonna do anything they're not going to form a relationship with soil microbes. And that means that we not only don't get the nutrients that we need, but we also have poor soil structure and poor landscape function and the whole thing just goes into a, a downward spiral. So what are going to be the things that we need to look at in order to, um, to stimulate that, that, those microbial functions? So we need to look at... Um, <sighs> I can't see the next slide. So I'm going to have to guess. Well, we obviously have to look at uh, animal impact. We have to look at root exudates and we have to look at plant diversity. That's what that slide should show. I don't know whether you can see it, but I can't. This is uh, yeah, pretty interesting. Not, uh, I don't know what happened to Kate and I don't know why. I can't see that slide. And I don't know whether you guys can see that slide because I can't get any feedback. This is very, very, uh, right, <laughs> very annoying. All right, so we want to stimulate microbial activity through animal impact, through root exudates and through plant diversity. I, could, I think I'd be better off doing this presentation without my slides. All right, so here's a case study um, from Stephen Rose Slate at Diamond Springs in Ferna in South Australia. Ferna's uh, relatively close to Millicent. They have a... To, around about a 700, and 700 millimetre rainfall. I think Steve said the rolling rainfall uh, at the moment was 655 mils. So it's slightly less than the rainfall in the southwest portion of WA. And the soil type, I'm just going to say it's sand because when you look at the photographs, you'll realise um, that it is sand. Now they had a, an issue with bracken and back in 2010, Steve decided to buy two sows just to see whether they would have any effect on the bracken. So um, here's, they, they aren't the same two sows, obviously, but this just gives you some idea of the sort of country that we're talking about. Uh, if you can see there in the background, you'll see there's lots of, lots of sand there. And I think this next photograph shows that even more clearly that comes up. So I think you would have to categorize that soil type as sand. And it probably looks fairly familiar to a lot of you in the Southwest of Western Australia. You can see there's lots of bracken here. And this is where the pigs have been in and they've done a really good job um, on eliminating the bracken for want of, a, want of a better word. But what I'm interested in is what has that actually done to the soil? What was the successional uh, plant sequence that we saw there? Um, and what has this done for, for profitability, I guess? Um, so the first stage after bare soil was broadleaf annuals. Um, so there was nettles and fat hen came in like so 12 months after the pigs had eliminated the bracken, disturbed the soil. Um, as they, you know, they dig around, there's lots of soil disturbance. There's animal impact in the form of urine and dung. And the other thing is that these animals also have access to another area where obviously where they're being fed, they're not being expected to survive on bracken. So, you know, their dung and their urine is bringing nutrients into that area as well from, from the other area where they're um, being fed. So this is three years after the bare sand. So there was bracken, then bare sand, and then three years down the track, we have a variety of annual grasses and uh, legumes coming in there. So nothing has been planted. These have all come in by themselves. There's arrowleaf clover there. 
there's um, three or four different species of annual grasses. So that's the successional change that's come through animal impact and obviously a huge impact on the microbiology in that soil. So what, what has happened to plant nutrient availability in that system? So Steve had taken um, soil samples in 2015 and then again in 2018. So we're seeing over a three year period here. So this is with uh, intensive animal impact, I guess, with pastured pigs. So organic matter in the soil um, has gone as almost like a six fold increase from 1.3% to 7.5% organic matter. Um, the amount of nitrogen uh, in the nitrate form has actually increased like almost 14 fold. And I guess that's probably not surprising with all the dung and urine from the pigs. Availability of phosphorus has increased eight fold. I know phosphorus is something that comes up time and time again in sandy areas. Well, you know, where people just say we, got, we have to add it. Um, but if you increase biological activity, I mean, you have to, I mean, the very fact that there is trees growing there, there's bracken growing there, and in uh, the southwest of Western Australia, we'll see other things like um, grass trees and um, tea trees. And, you know, if there's plants growing there and they have to have phosphorus in their cells in order to function because ATP is absolutely essential to cell function, and that's adenosine triphosphate, triphosphate. So ATP, you, you you know, there isn't a, a plant cell that can function without ATP. So when you see plants growing there, they're obviously getting phosphorus from somewhere and they're using microbes to access it from the soil. It won't necessarily show up on a soil test uh, unless it's in an available form. So obviously having the pigs in there has increased the availability of phosphorus. Um, so calcium has increased threefold. Zinc has increased almost 33 times the availability of zinc. Uh, boron has increased fivefold, copper has increased fivefold, and the pH went from 5.8 to 6.5. So everything very positive with that animal impact. And the other point that Steve made um, in an email today, actually, um, I think he said, was it Southeast Asia? I think he said that the, the market for, pig, uh, for pork products in Southeast Asia would be very good from Western Australia. So this is something, you know, that WA farmers could definitely think about. It's not like you wouldn't have a market um, if you were to use something like pigs for rehabilitating um, degraded soils and just, just using them for animal impact and getting plants to, when, when you've got all that um, green growth with those very actively growing plants, you're going to have lots of root exudates and you're not interfering with them. I think this is the important thing, not interfering with them by um, applying any synthetic fertiliser. So I can't see the next slide, I'm sorry. I have no idea why this is working so slowly. I'm just looking over, everything switched on here, it's all connected and it's just not working. So <laughs> we just have to sit here and wait. Uh, this was supposed to be a really uh, brief overview so that we could get onto questions. All right, so where did the increase in soil nutrients come from? Well, they were increased by, uh, activated by an increase in soil biological activity. And um, so by 2018, Stephen Rose had 2,000 pigs in a commercial free range pig operation. So it's obviously been a very successful venture for them. And this is what um, part of their operation looks like now. So the pigs are here on the right hand side. Um, and, and they have access to, um, to those, to the, some of them have access like back into, the, into those bracken areas at the back. Here on the left hand side, this is a buffer area because to have free range uh, pastured pigs, there has to be a buffer between Stephen Rose's property and the neighbour's property. And I don't know whether you can see it on that photograph, but there's like a reddish tinge all through there. And those of you who are familiar with pastures will know that that's sorrel. Um, so there's sorrel, there's Guilford grass, and there's other plants that we would probably regard as being undesirable in this pasture. Well, the pigs have done a really good job of getting them all out on this side. Um, so sorrel, Guilford grass, and, and other things. Um, the soil is much higher in carbon on this side, and um, the pasture composition is much better. Again, without anybody actually going out and planting anything there, just having the pigs there has improved it. 
Um, the other great thing is that Diamond Springs, which is uh, Stephen Rose's property, won the Champion Pork Award in the branded meat category at the Sydney Royal Fine Food Show in 2018. Uh, and they have won several other awards since then. So it's been a very um, profitable and productive enterprise for them. And, um, you know, so it's nice to know that as well as regenerating the resource base, they're also producing a high quality product that's going to be very nutritious for uh, for consumers. And so, you know, you're not just produce, you're not just increasing the health of your own land. It's actually good for community at large to have, you know, food that's produced in a, in a holistic way. Uh, I think I already mentioned that the pigs have reduced the incidence of sorrel and onion weed. I think you might call Guilford grass on onion weed in Western Australia. I'm not really sure. So just discussing this with uh, Steve, he's saying that the effects are probably due to a combined effect of aeration, um, which the pigs are always digging around in the soil, and the stimulation of soil biological activity through their dung and urine. So, you know, I have no problems at all with people um, disturbing the soil with machinery, for example, because it's a natural thing that animals will do. And in Western Australia, you would have had your, um, your bedons and your potteroos and everything always digging around in the soil. And then on other parts of the property where they don't have pigs, there's priority grazing. Um, that's Dick Richardson's grazing naturally system uh, with sheep and cattle. And uh, Steve is also using biostimulants that he produces himself. A lot of those are vermi liquid based. So he has his own worm farm and he, always, he also combines humates with those. So it's a bit of a, I think he calls it his bio-nutrient, uh, bio-stimulant stack. He's, he's got all his kind of um, things that he, he considers to be important are in there. And I think the great thing about biostimulants is that they really do increase biodiversity in the soil. And as a result, so this is not an area that's grazed by pigs now, where I'm, I'm going to be just showing you another example. So using, um, just using good grazing management, and um, we don't have time today unless you want to ask a question in Q&A about what priority grazing is. Um, but what it's doing is really pushing the plants, like pushing the plants to produce lots of root exudates and then combining that with biostimulants, which is going to stimulate the soil even further. So it's, it's like a, you get um, a symbiotic effect. You get one and one is equal to five or something when you're doing all of those things at the same time. So in 15 months since they started, priority grazing on their land. Um, if this photograph comes up, I, it's possible that you can see it and I can't, I'm not really sure what's going on here. Um, but there should be a photograph there of the top 20 centimetres of soil. So I don't know what's happening, Kate. I can't see these slides. Okay, so it's just not me. Okay, yeah. It's just All right, well. All right, uh, who knows why? I'm sitting right next to my um, my modem for my internet and I don't know, but the, I think this happened last time as well. So I can't see what everyone else can see, which is just a little uh, frustrating. But so uh, hopefully what you're looking at there then is uh, the top 20 centimetres of what was, you know, pretty much white sand. And you can see all the colours that are coming down through there, it's like the darker coloration, uh, which is, some of it is organic matter, but not very much. Most of that is root exudation. So what's, that's a, a priority paddock. In other words, it's like really made a priority in terms of grazing. We can talk more about that if you want to in the Q&A. Um, or maybe, you know, you could uh, have Steve come talk to you or Dick Richardson come talk to you. It's, it's, a, it's a method that um, Dick Richardson has developed from his experience in South Africa and his experience right around Australia. Basically, I've seen it working up in the dry tropics in Northern Australia and in the wet tropics in Northern Australia and also working in Southern Australia. So it's all about actually forcing plants to work and to uh, to pump out their root exudates. If you just have, I mean, I will say categorically, if you just have animals in the same paddock year round, you're not going to build topsoil. You really have to move animals around and you really have to be very aware of your grazing management so that, that what we see as a general rule in uh, in Western Australia, for example, or the southwest of Western Australia, um, of people using uh, fertilisers as a substitute for soil function and just having animals with continual access to pastures, uh, that is not a formula that is going to build topsoil for you. 
Uh, so regenerating the resource base actually requires human crea creativity. I mean, everybody's situation is going to be slightly different. No one can really tell you what to do. Um, and that's why Regen Ag is exciting, really, because, you know, you have to think about it and what if I did this and what if I did that? And, and you want to replace those expensive inputs with, with your creativity so that, uh, as I said, just having ryegrass or just ryegrass and some clover and spending a lot of money on fertilisers. You know, WA farmers spend a lot of money on fertilisers and you're using those fertilisers as a substitute for soil function. They are not necessary. If you can stimulate soil function in another way, you will not need to use fertiliser. And we'll know that we're succeeding in doing that when we get that green light back up near the blue line. In other words, what we want to do is to have 98% of gross farm revenue going into farmers' pockets rather than going to input providers. So we have to... Um, come up that's nice for a change so this big blue area here we want that to be green and we want uh we want that to be profitability for farmers so if we can produce that much output we we obviously have the potential to do it we just have to change that profitability equation and if we want to change that profitability equation then some changes need to take place in the soil microbiome because the way it is at the moment it's dysfunctional and it's not actually um, enabling profitability to occur. A lot of the things that we're doing are actually standing in the way of profitability. That's, I guess that's what I'm trying to say. So what about soil as a carbon sink? Um, because carbon is going to be the thing that is gonna underpin everything else. Carbon, increasing soil carbon is going to be what's going to increase those uh, nutrient availabilities you saw on, um, the, the example from Stephen Rose Slate's property that they've increased soil carbon, what was it, from 1.3 to 7 point something. So, and, you know, massive increases in um, organic, sorry, that was organic matter. Um, it's also going to improve water holding capacity and it's going to enable over time for, uh, even in your hot, dry summers, for things to be green over summer. But if we just like monetize, think about monetizing that for a minute, you know, the government has, taken a long time to uh, to introduce a some kind of a carbon credit scheme. They finally have. Um, and has anyone received carbon credits for increasing soil carbon? Well, yes, the answer, the answer is that they have. And uh, that was um, Niels Olsen um, back in 2019. So last year we had a world first and an Australian first. And the reason it was a world first was because this is the only time that any farmer anywhere in the world has been paid for soil carbon under a government, a government um, regulated scheme. So we had, oh, what was it? Back in 2010, we had this carbon farming initiative or something that morphed into so many things and that eventually became the emission, Emissions Reduction Fund that I think Last year or this year, they changed it to the Climate Solutions Fund. It's like every year the government changes the name of it. But it is the Australian Federal Government's currently called Climate Solutions Fund. Um, it's part of us uh, contributing to Australian emissions targets under the Paris Agreement. So on the 14th of March 2019, quite historic because the only farmer anywhere in the world who have been awarded carbon credits under a government regulated scheme. So Niels Olsen. Um, received those first credits and he also received credits again in uh, 2020. So he's he's had two lots of uh, carbon credits and uh, the way his carbon, his soil was measured was the top 30 centimetres and then the next 70 centimetres. So the soil was measured down to a depth of one metre and I think this is really important. A lot of soil tests that have been done in the past has just measured the top 10 centimetres or the top 15 centimetres, and that's been for the purposes of suggesting to farmers that they had a phosphorus deficiency or a nitrogen deficiency and they needed to go out and apply fertiliser. So most of those very shallow tests were simply done as the basis for soil um, fertiliser recommendations. So if you really want to know what's happening to your carbon, you're going to have to start measuring a lot deeper because... We want to see carbon increasing down here below 30 centimetres. That's the sequestration of significance. That is what is really going to drive landscape function and farm profitability. Of course, the top soil carbon is also important. Um, but what happened in Niels Olsen's case was that the largest increase in soil carbon that were actually observed in that deep increment in the 30 to 100 centimetre part of the soil profile. In other words, below 30 centimetres. So in order for that to happen, 
you've got to have a lot of um, deep root activity. You've got to have roots getting deeper and lots of exudates coming out of those roots. So in 2019, um, he sequestered 11.2 tonnes of CO2 equivalents per hectare in a 12 month period. So in 12 months, um, over, I think they measured 100 hectares, 11.2 tonnes of CO2 per hectare, and then this year, 13.7 tonnes of CO2 equivalents per hectare. In other words, it's getting better every year. And I was just talking to Niels on the phone last week, and he was suggesting that um, it's it has increased every year over the last four or five years. Like So he says that the first year that they started, they probably took two tonnes of CO2 per hectare out of the atmosphere, and then the next year, like, four tonnes and eight tonnes and 10 tonnes, so on. So it takes a little while. In the very, uh, when you're first changing from conventional ag to uh, to regenerative ag, you're not suddenly going to start taking, you know, 10 tonnes per hectare of CO2 out of the atmosphere because the soil microbiome has to get organised. Um, roots have to get deeper down into the soil because all of this is going, to, is going to be root exudates going to come out of the root tips of deep-rooted plants um, so and, and Niels is under the opinion that it's going to be like in the same way that grass grows grass if you like or you know money generates money that uh, carbon is going to grow carbon he he's under the opinion that this is going to increase it every year and I tend to agree with him there's no such thing as uh, saturated soils at least not in that in that deep increment so um, so there's been lots and lots of field days obviously People have been very interested in, in what happened and people have become very interested in receiving carbon credits. And uh, if you can see a photograph on your screen, which I can't see, um, there's probably a hundred people there, I suppose, at a field day. And um, I'm just gonna click right to the next one because I can't see that one anyway. And the next one just shows you a close up of the, um, the hydraulic soil corer that's used to um, to measure soil carbon. So obviously if you're going to be measuring to one metre depth, you're not going to be out there with spade digging holes or you're not going to be out there with a manual soil core. So I hope you can all see that. I, I can't see it, so I'm going to click to the next slide. Um, the next slide is the soil key renovator, which is the machine that key developed for, um, for basically for regenerating his pastures and he may not make a huge amount of money out of carbon credits, but I think he's going to do quite well out of his soil key renovator. And I was speaking to him last week. He said they just employed six, six new members of staff um, to make these things as fast as they possibly can. But the key to it all, if I can say the key to the soil key renovator, is actually the diversity um, of plants. So with the soil key renovator, it, it's a method it's a tool, if you like. It's a tool for establishing a diversity of plants. And as far as I'm concerned, it's the diversity of plants that um, is, is the fundamental factor that's allowing these soil carbon increases. So you can see we've got um, a radish plant here. So that's in the brassica family. We've got some peas here. So that's in the favaci family. There's some grasses in there. So um, I'm going to talk in a little minute about the key. What we really need um, are lots of different plant families and flowers. So it's not about grasses, it's about having lots of different flowering plants in there. And the soil key renovator is a like a strip tillage um, equipment that it churns up about 17% of the of the soil area, um, which is not much really. I mean if it's churning up 17%, like the strip tillage is is tilling about 17%. That means you've got 83% that's not turned over, but it does throw a lot of soil around. So it actually looks like there's more than 17%, but it's it's mulching. What he's doing is actually mulching um, plant material into the soil with the strip tillage. And um, Niels believes that that is great for feeding earthworms and other things. They see big increases in earthworm numbers under this with this method. Um, you're also preserving some of the original uh, pasture so that you're not getting erosion. And then in the 17% that you're cultivating, you're putting in a, a wide diversity of plants. So the whole thing is, is based very much on diversity. Um, when I was asking him about it last week, he said that one of his favourite plants is chicory. It's one of my favourites as well. With very deep tap roots and really great for increasing soil carbon. So what do we actually need to know about managing soil 
as a carbon sink or what is it that we, uh, what are the key factors here? Well, it's been calculated that two thirds of the sequestered carbon in, in Neil Olson's case actually came from root exudates, even though 10 years ago, um, the experts said there, there would be nothing come from root exudates, but now they've admitted that it has to come from root exudates because they can't explain it any other way. They don't know how it could have possibly got there if it didn't come from root exudates. So this was the photograph that was on my header slide. This is from Phil Lee, who has um, taken some absolutely amazing pho <coughs> sorry, photos of the rhizosphere. So we have a, a plant root here and um, all these beautiful exudates coming out of plant roots. Now, why why is there so much material coming out of plant roots? Well, some of this is um, sugars, basically energy to feed microbes, but there's a lot of signaling molecules in there as well. So this like, you know, there are several thousand chemicals actually that my, um, plants produce in order to signal to microbes for what it is that they want. So when people say, well, my soil hasn't got sufficient uh, phosphorus or copper or zinc or calcium or magnesium or whatever it might be, it's because there are not sufficient signaling molecules coming out and not sufficient energy coming out of the roots of the plants to actually feed the microbes that are able to make those things available. That's why they're not showing up on a soil test. The soil test is only going to show you what's very readily available. The extract that's used is going to be, it's not going to be, um, you know, the method that's used in the lab is not going to be what um, what microbes use. So these microbes that are being fed on root exudates are producing enzymes like phosphatase enzyme, for example, that is able to release phosphorus. Phosphorus is very tightly bound to things like aluminium and iron and calcium, depending on the pH of the soil is going to depend on what the phosphorus is bound to. Plant roots are not able to extract phosphorus that is bound. Um, it's called fixed phosphorus. Phosphatase enzyme is able to extract that phosphorus. So oftentimes we see we'll do a soil test, it shows there's virtually no phosphorus there, and then you you uh, produce plants in a way that is going to stimulate the soil microbiome, as I said, through animal impact, through um, through using biostimulants or through using plant diversity or preferably through all three at the same time. And then you get this massive outpouring of uh, root exudates that is going to stimulate the microbes that produce phosphatase enzyme and then all of a sudden your phosphorus levels come up. So root exudation is what it's all about and you want to get roots down really deep into the soil. So if we look at plants like ryegrass has pathetically uh, shallow roots, not a fan of ryegrass as you probably gathered, white clover has incredibly shallow roots. So we need to look at plants that have deep roots and once we start getting that the root exudates down into the deep soil profile and change happening in the, in the deep soil profile, then everything on the farm can change, including the fact that it can be greener over summer and it's going to be more profitable um, for you. So how do you know, when you're just looking at your plants, how do you know whether they're exuding carbon or not? Um, well, you will see that they have riser sheaths. And um, this was a photograph of some, um, well, just a little grass plant actually from my garden. I can't see it, but I'm presuming that you guys can. Um, this was taken, I took this photograph because people in Ireland were telling me that it was too cold and too wet in Ireland for plants to produce any exudates. And we had just had our fourth lot of snow here in Armidale in Northern New South Wales. And it had been a cold, wet winter four lots of snow and I went out and I was wetting the garden and I pulled, everything I pulled up had beautiful riser sheaths on it. So I hope you can see that. Um, that will tell you when you have riser sheaths on the roots, when you can't actually see the roots themselves, that will tell you that the plant is, um, is exuding carbon. That's what you need to look for. And that means that it's going to be supporting um, soil biology. So here's another one from, uh, again, from this is from Canada, from a cold area. Um, I can see this one. So the, the seed is here. These are the seminal roots. This is a very young plant and already it's got lots and lots of roots and lots of beautiful riser sheaths. It's getting down deep and it's producing lots of carbon. These are the uh, crown roots coming from, oh, from the crown of the plant <laughs> and they've got beautiful riser sheaths on them as well. So that's what we want to see. 
Uh, and this that farmer, by the way, doesn't use any synthetic fertiliser. He's just put a vermi liquid on that seed. And plants actually don't have access to that extraordinary rhizosphere microbiome. In other words, all the microbes that are living around the plant roots, the, the plant is, is trying to survive in something like sand all by itself with no access to all the microbes that could help help it if we have disabled the male spider. So if we grow plants in conditions that disable the whole process, we're put in the situation where we more or less have to add fertilizer to make it to work. And the things that will disable it will be uh, low diversity in our pastures. So just ryegrass or just ryegrass and clover. Um, high analysis fertilizers are going to disable the whole situation and set stocking. So if animal, we have animals continuously in contact with plants, that is going to disable the soil forming process. So we have to be very aware of what it is that is getting in the way of, uh, of soil building. So the emphasis is actually on management. The emphasis is not on inputs. The em emphasis is on management. We need to replace inputs with management. And appropriate management is going to be holistic. By holistic, I mean we have to take account of the whole, of, of everything that's going on. We have just this single focus way of thinking about things. Oh, I'm just going to plant, plant this one thing and I'm going to put this fertilizer on it and I'm going to expect that to work as a holistic system. Um, so when I say holistic, I'm not just meaning holistic management in the term that um, Alan Savory would use it from, for example, I just mean we, we need to think holistically. We need to enhance biodiversity. If we're not seeing more species or not, we could even be deliberately planting more species we might see biodiversity in the terms in terms of um, having lots of beneficial insects come in, um, more birds. Um, all of we have to think about and and things like uh, earthworms, etc. You know, we have to see every year we want to see more and more life on our farms, more diversity, and then we know that we're going in the right direction. And we have to put microbes front and centre. We have to be, even though we can't see them, we have to be thinking about the fact that it is microbes that are running everything. Microbes are running our human bodies. Microbes are running your ruminant animals' bodies. Microbes are running your soils. As I said, I think I said in the last, in the previous uh, Lower Blackwood Land Care seminar, if I didn't say it, I'm going to say it now. <laughs> there are more microbial cells than plant cells in a plant. So if we were to look at a plant leaf or a plant stem or plant roots under a, a high powered microscope, we would see that there are more microbes in there and there are plant cells. There are also more microbes in your ruminant animals than there are animal cells, and there are more mi microbes in the human body than there are human cells. So microbes front and centre, they are running this planet, and right at the moment, <laughs> we're all being confined indoors because of one, right? Um, but we're not going to worry about that. So biodiversity is actually the key factor to, to all of this, and it's microbial diversity particularly that, that is important. Um, so I can't see that slide, so I'm just going to click right on to the next one. Uh, so in the, last, uh, in the last webinar, I did talk about the Jena biodiversity experiment in eastern Germany, and I showed you lots of slides about that. Um, so I've just taken one slide from that presentation. I just want to remind you that if you want to build deep soil, then you have to have a whole lot of different kinds of plants in order to, to do that. So... Um, over here on the left-hand side, we have two different kinds. I'll say two plant families is what I should probably say. In my discussion with Kate this afternoon, we realised that we have to stop talking about species and start talking about families because you, we could say, you know, you need to have a, an eight-way mix or a 12-way mix or something, and you could easily find 12 species of grasses to plant. And that's not the kind of diversity we need. We, we actually need to have different plant families. So here we have a grass and we have a flower of some kind, so a herb. So we've only got two, two plant families in there and they can only build very shallow soil. When we go to eight in this diagram, we have much deeper soil. And I did talk about the, that biodiversity experiment in some detail last time and you have all those slides available as PDF. So you can go back and um, review that. So only plants and microbes working together we have to have a conversation going on between the plants and the microbes and they will work together to build fertile, well-structured soil that is going to, at the end of the day, improve profitability, which is what, what it's all about, right? That's what we're farming for. So 
So what happens when we have all these different kinds of plants growing together? We actually have root mingling. In other words, the, the roots will be in contact with each other. Some of those roots will be very fine roots that we can't see with the human eye. But um, if we've got a multi-species mix or a multi-family mix, we should say now, um, there will be lots of different plant species. And what effect does that actually have on plant productivity? What effect does it have on immunity? And what effect does it have on uh, tolerance to stress, for example, drought? Um, well, <laughs> it has a very positive effect on all of those things. And I'm just giving you a very brief overview today. So I suppose plant productivity is going to be something that's going to be of importance if you're looking at um, forages, for example, if you're in a situation of having ruminant animals and you're looking at forages, what would be the difference between just having ryegrass or ryegrass and clover and having um, a range of plant families in there? What would that do in terms of plant productivity? Well, what would happen is that when we have um, different plants growing together, now again, I can't see this diagram, so I can't use my pointer, sorry. But if you can see that, what you have on the left-hand side is a, a legume and what you have on the right-hand side is a grass. And you'll see that there's lots and lots of dots on that diagram and um, and, and there's a, a line, like a horizontal line, which is the soil surface. So below that we have the roots and all the dots that are around plant roots basically represent all the microbes that live around plant roots. So that's the rhizosphere microbiome. And then you'll see that the bit that's above ground, which we call the phyllosphere, which is the leaves and, and the stems and the flowers and the seeds and everything that's above ground constitutes the phyllosphere because a phyllode is a plant leaf. And you'll see there's lots of dots and spots all around the phyllosphere. And that's all the microbes that live on the outside of the plant, um, like on the leaf surfaces and everything. And then what you really can't see from that diagram, I suppose, is the endosphere, which is everything that lives inside the plant. So we have the rhizosphere, the endosphere and the phyllosphere are the main regions in, a, um, in the plant holobiome, we call it, like it's a continuum. It's a continuum between the plant and the soil. Just because we can see, root, we shouldn't be able to see the roots. The roots should have rhizos shoots on them so you can't um, actually see the roots themselves. Um, but it, that's going to be a continuum that extends out into the soil. So the whole thing, we want it to be all incredibly biologically active and everything that we do, we want to be able to stimulate that, the soil microbiome and the plant microbiome. And what we're seeing um, with the research that's going on in, the, in uh, eco ecology, I suppose, rather more so than in agriculture, is that in a situation where plant is in a stressful situation, like let's say it's growing in soil that's got a lot of salt, like a saline soil, or if it's being contaminated with... Um, you know, heavy metals, heavy metal contaminated soil, or those kinds of things, or even in a drought situation where the plant is stressed, um, it will call on microbes from the soil microbiome to assist. So if we have two very different kinds of plants growing side by side um, and sharing their root microbiome, I guess, then one plant can, if it, if it can't get the genetics it needs from its own rhizosphere, it can actually borrow them from the rhizosphere of a neighbour. And if the plants are very different, they're much more likely, the, microbe, the microbes are much more willing to actually cooperate in keeping the whole of the plant community alive. And the power is in the microbiome. So if you think about it, let's go back 200 years to uh, when we had hundreds of different kinds of ground cover plants. Or well, in my previous um, webinar, I talked about all the terrestrial orchids and the flowers and, and lots of things that were of fundamental significance to First Nation people uh, for their food source. And there's a lot of different kinds of plants growing together. Now, if you look at this from the point of view of, um, of the soil microbiome and, we, and the plants that were there were able to stay green over summer. So we had plants that were green over summer, photosynthesizing over summer, even though it was a hot, dry summer. So we had an environment that was green year round because the soil had very high moisture holding capacity because it had high soil carbon and it was well structured and from the microbiome point of view if the microbes in the soil can keep all of those plants alive then those plants are going to photosynthesize over summer and provide sugars and other forms of energy and important um, other other important things for the soil microbiome so it is of the to the benefit of the soil microbiome to actually keep the plants alive. 
but they're not able to do that in a monoculture because there is nothing to share. If, you, if your neighbour is exactly the same as you and you haven't got something that you need and the neighbour doesn't have it either, um, it, it's like having, you know, uh, it, it means it just means that there's a whole lot more tools in the toolbox. And what we see in a drought situation, for example, is that when plants are becoming water stressed, they will actually change the endophytic um, microbes. In other words, the microbes that live inside them will be different to when they're not water stressed. So they say, okay, I need a different group of microbes living inside me now because I I need things like um, some enzymes, for example, that are going to improve my water use efficiency or I need thicker cell walls or I need something that I need microbes to help me to maintain and they will take in from the soil a whole lot of different microbes um, to enable them to respond to water deficit. But if, there's, if it's just all one kind of plant, like ryegrass, well, they can't get the microbes that they need. So plant diversity enables the sharing of genetic material from the shared soil microbiome. And that is one of the reasons that diversity is so important. Plus we also have, um, you know, deep rooted plants like chicory um, that are much more able to withstand drought for other reasons, not necessarily just microbial reasons. So I've only got a couple of minutes left. I think I'm getting pretty close to the end of this um, presentation anyway. Um, so what happens is, as I just explained, I think that where we have plants that have, if, if the plant is similar, in other words, if it's in the same family, so a family would be something like legumes. It doesn't matter whether it's peas or faba beans or crimson clover or arrow leaf clover or lucerne or something, if it's in the legume family, and everything that's in that family is similar in terms of its microbiome. They're not different enough. So everything that's in the grass family is going to be very similar. So in Australia, we have something like a thousand species. I think of grasses in Australia, pretty close to a thousand species of grasses. Well, that doesn't mean to say that uh, there is enough diversity in there for soil to function, even if you had all, all the 1,000 in the, in the one place. If, if they have similar microbiomes, they have a negative feedback effect on plant productivity. In other words, they're competing with each other. And if they have dissimilar microbiomes, if they're from different families and very different kinds of plants, it actually has a positive feedback effect on plant productivity. And that's been shown time and time again in, in research that if you have very different kinds of plants, so you would still have the same number of plants, the population of plants that you'd have per hectare would be the same. But if you make them really different kinds of plants, then they're going to have a positive feedback effect on productivity in terms of like, I mean, how much biomass can you produce in a hectare of land? And the ideal is to have at least four functional, well, to have four functional groups and then try and have as many species as you can. So what is a functional group? Well, in the literature, a functional group is grasses are just one functional group. So no point in having 12 different grasses there. They're all in the same group. Your legumes is one functional group. Your short herbs is one functional group. So short herbs would be things like, um, like plantain, for example. Um, so it's not, when we're saying, saying short herbs, we're talking about short non-leguminous herbs. So we're not talking about things like white clover. Um, so it has to be a short herb, so not a grass and not a legume, and then tall herbs. The chicory is an obvious tall herb, or if it was in, um, in, a, in an annual mix, then a tall herb would be something like sunflower. Um, so there are also some very tall legumes, like some hemp, for example, but that doesn't count because that's in the legume group. So if we have those four functional groups, and if you go back to my last webinar, I talked about the Yenna experiment, which was based on four functional groups. Um, and this has now come out, we've seen in in the literature in other and research in other areas that where they have the four functional groups is repeatedly where they're getting the best results. So if you want lots of productivity from your farm, think about those four functional groups because that's where it's going to maximise things for you. Oh, so hopefully you can see that. <laughs> you must be getting sick of me saying I can't see it. It's really interesting here looking at a blank screen and I'm just hoping that you can see it. Uh, so what, what you should be able to see on the left-hand side is uh, four green bars, which are perennial ryegrass. So this is Irish research, um, but it's very interesting what they discovered. So this is 
This is like um, replacing fertiliser with diversity. So on the left-hand side, there should be four green bars with perennial ryegrass that's been fertilised with different amounts of nitrogen. So remember, you just have a monoculture of grass here. And the different amounts of nitrogen from memory were a ryegrass with none, 120, 240 and 360 units of N per hectare. So that is, um, that's nitrogen. That's just straight nitrogen. So if that was urea, for example, which is 46% N, that 360 kilograms of N per hectare would be 783 kilos of urea, 783 kilos of urea per hectare. So what that shows you is what we know already is that now I've, I can see it now, so hopefully you can see my pointer, is the more nitrogen you apply, the more ryegrass will grow. And we know that that's what happens in monocultures and that's why people think that they need fertiliser. But then when we look over here on the right-hand side, these four blue bars, this is actually a multi-species multi-family mix with four functional groups. So it is, it's not that complicated. It does have perennial ryegrass in it. Also has Timothy, which is a, a grass that's quite widely grown in the Northern Hemisphere. It has red clover, which is a deep rooted uh, legume. It has plantain, which we could call that a short herb. And it has chicory, which we could call a tall herb because when chicory flowers, it's way over your head. Um, so this, this multi-family mix of four functional groups, even with no, so we've got zero, 120, 240, and 360 kilograms of nitrogen per hectare, even with none, um, it was basically the same. With no nitrogen, was so just having four functional groups gave you basically the same yield as having to put 360 units of N onto ryegrass. When ryegrass wasn't fertilised, uh, it did nothing. And the other thing in this Irish research, and this was undertaken by the Irish Department of Agriculture, it would be wonderful to see the Australian Departments of Agriculture do some research into biodiversity. Might be waiting a long time, but um, was that they also looked at mixes of just uh, straight grasses, straight legumes and straight brassicas to form a triangle, like say like a soil texture triangle where you might have sand, silt and clay as the three points on your triangle. So at some point you've just got grasses, at another point you've just got brassicas, and at the other point you've just got legumes. And what they found was that uh, the sweet spot was right in the middle of that triangle. So where they had an equal mix of grasses, legumes, and uh, brassicas was where they got maximum uh, production. And also in a drought, everything that was at the corners of the triangles died. So if they just had straight ryegrass um, in a drought situation, it just died. Whereas when the ryegrass was in with other plants in the middle of the triangle, so there was ryegrass in with legumes and brassicas, it didn't die in the drought, which is what we've seen. Again, I've, shown, I've talked about that in previous webinars. So diversity is incredibly important to productivity, to drought tolerance, um, and also to plant immunity, um, which I've got up to the end of my time now. Oh, I've actually gone way over time. Sorry, Kate, I was thinking I had an hour. <laughs> oh dear, I talked longer than I should have and I can't see the next slide anyway, so God only knows what it is. Um, who knows? Sorry. I was I have spoken I have talked for a whole hour and I only meant to talk for 45 minutes. So and I can't see the next slide, so <laughs> well, <laughs> anybody's I'll just say the audience hasn't come through with a lot of questions yet. So if everyone can sort of think about what they'd like to ask in the next five minutes while Christine finishes off, that'd be Great. Okay, so my next slide has just popped up. So um, don't forget when in your multi in your multi-family mixes, don't forget the short and tall herbs. Um, these are things that are not legumes. And examples include um, chicory, plantain, flax, yarrow, sheep's burnet, evening primrose. Evening primrose grows along the sides of the road in Western Australia. I've seen it there. I know you have it. Uh, Facilia, sheep's parsley. You know, there's a whole lot of things. Um, and I will send some notes through as well to Kate with, uh, with examples of the different kinds of things. So these herbs, in fact, in some places where the roadsides are, you know, and sometimes, sometimes the roadsides are quite, quite diverse in some, some areas, you, you'd be surprised what you might, might find there. I think there's probably the opportunity for some of these things to be grown as well in West Australia. Um, if, if the seeds are expensive or if the seeds aren't available, 
for people to be able to include them into uh, multifamily mixes because, you know, there's some things there that are not really high high biomass, like if you look at sheep's parsley, for example, you know, it's not a high biomass plant, but it's really important to have those kinds of things in there with the mix because they really stimulate the microbiome and everything else will be more productive and more resilient um, when, when you have those other things in there. Um, so as I mentioned, drought tolerance, we now know that plants are able to actually share their microbiomes. And if we have diverse plant communities, they can recruit microbes from the microbiomes of dissimilar plants, provided that those dissimilar plants are close by. So I, ha I have got to the end of the presentation. I did run a little bit over time. I'm sorry about that. I was thinking the wrong thing. Um, so that's really all I wanted to say, Kate. So we can end that. Do I just press close? Is that, will that be the right thing? You can leave that on there for the moment. Um, oh, okay. Um, all right. I might get you to turn off your microphone while I ask the question and then turn it back on. Yep. I think because okay. we're getting a bit of feedback. So. Yeah. Um, great. Okay. So, well, that was fascinating as always, Christine, and I think um, a lot of food for thought there. Um, I've got a few questions here, so I'll I'll just start with the first one. So this person says uh, they're they're interested in transitioning um, over to more regenerative practices, but I can't afford to lose production for a season. Do you have any advice on where to start? For example, how can I maintain profitability and transition over to more regenerative practices at the same time? Thanks, Kate. I think it's uh, it can be overwhelming for people to think about a whole lot of things that we haven't, most farmers have never had to think about before. You know, like plant diversity and using biostimulants and all of that, it can be overwhelming. I think humans in general, we find any kind of change overwhelming. <laughs> I know I'm not very good with the technology. <laughs> um, so the key is really, you know, it's one step at a time, like we say with everything else when it comes to change. And also, you know, looking at that curve of, of the innovators. Um, in some countries, the, the leading edge innovators are actually being supported by government and government is actively encouraging people to make innovation and make change. And, Government is actively supporting farmer to farmer networks in some countries and, and, you know, financially assisting with that process of the transfer of information because it is new for everybody. It's new for the research people as well, finding, discovering new things every day about how the soil microbiome works. So it's going to be constantly changing. But I think the key thing is not to be overwhelmed by the amount of new information, but certainly... Um, you will have to, you know, farmers will have to actively seek out information. They will need to listen to webinars. They will need to um, to talk to other farmers about it. And uh, and they also need to experiment on a small area. You, you can't, you, you cannot simply transform your whole farm overnight. And I know that once people actually start on this process, they become very uh, eager to, uh, would you know would really like to to make massive transformations but it's something that you really have to do take step by step I know that on some farms where we've been doing research and we've said look we just want you to keep this small area as a control basically in this small area we want you to keep doing what you've always done so that in 10 years time you can look back and go wow well, my whole farm would look like that if I'd kept on doing what I've always done and a few years down the track people just do not want to keep that control anymore. They don't want to keep that control area. I mean, they don't want to keep doing what they've always done. Um, so I think that's probably one thing that's important. Keep one area where you where you decide, okay, this is going to be, this is how I've always managed and I'm going to keep one area like that. And then very slowly, I'm going to start transforming the whole farm, but bit by bit, small, small areas. Just start with one small area and experiment with something perhaps that another farmer in your region has done or another farmer in another part of Australia that has got very similar soil types and similar rainfall patterns, you know, to you so that it will be something that will be transferable. So there's no point, for example, uh, in a, for a farmer in the southwest of WA perhaps looking to see uh, what somebody in Sweden was doing or someone in Canada was doing or, you know what I mean, like there'll be, there'll be other farmers that, in your region or at least in regions that are similar to yours and and just try it and and just I mean the other thing is 
it's so hard to get out of your head that you have to have fertilizer to make plants grow. It is really hard to discard that belief. There is a saying in South Africa, and that is that if you haven't discarded at least one firmly held belief in the last 12 months, check your pulse, you may be dead, <laughs> um, which is probably a bit <laughs> over the top. But the, the point is we have so many deeply held beliefs about how soil works that are not correct and it is very hard to discard those. And it's usually only by first-hand experience, by actually seeing it for yourself, um, that you can go, okay, so yeah, I don't need fertiliser. So let's say you just have a small area and you decide to do something. Um, I guess the easiest option is, is to have you have a diverse mix that makes sure you've got those four functional groups in there. Don't worry about disturbing the soil. Or you could even use something like, um, you know, in Stephen Rose Slate's case, like use something like pigs to get in there and dig all that soil up and disturb it and aerate it and, you know, get urine and dung and animal impact and all those things that are going to, you know, the, the microbiology of our soils is just, it's so close to being dead that it's not funny. We really have to stimulate the microbes in our soil and don't be afraid of disturbance. So there's a, a hypothesis called the uh, intermediate disturbance hypothesis and it's just like a, it's a, it's a bell curve. So what happens at one end of that is that you have zero disturbance and at the other end you have like incredible disturbance. So incredible disturbance in terms of a soil would be if someone came in with a moldboard plough and completely inverted the soil and turned it all upside down. I mean, that is just over the whole paddock, like 100% of the soil completely inverted with a moldboard plough. That is too much disturbance. But at the other end of that spectrum, we have people using glyphosate to uh, kill existing vegetation, not touching the soil. They're putting all those poisons into the environment and we're leaving the soil totally undisturbed. Well, soil doesn't function very well when it's totally undisturbed. So we need some intermediate disturbance there. So it is okay to get in and disturb the soil in an intermediate kind of a way in order to get your um, diverse plant community in there and then start observing what actually happens to the soil, how things change, what happens when the animals come in, how, how animal behaviour changes, how animal health improves. And I can't overemphasise the importance of grazing management. If you have livestock, I mean, the very first thing that you would need to change is grazing management before you even did anything else. Having animals constantly in contact with plants is very detrimental. You know, so, so grazing management needs to change. I know there's lots of opinions about that, about like how it needs to change. And um, so you do have to be a bit careful which expert you listen to. But it's definitely something that um, set stopping uh, is not going to work. And the main thing is that you have to force plants to, to uh, produce lots of root exudates. That, that, that's what the grazing has to be about, actually stimulating those plants to not be lazy and to do something. So I'll switch off my audio, okay? Thanks, Christina. I think you've answered a couple of these questions. Um, you were elaborating on priority grazing techniques um, and generally um, how does stocking need to change based on preserving the microbiome plant? Does this generally mean running lower stock levels with the main advantage in cost saving? Uh, as a general rule, you want to have the highest stock density that you can manage with priority grazing. So as a general rule, you would increase your stock numbers, provided that you match um, stock numbers to carrying capacity. So you have to be good at your uh, feed budgeting. Some people will use something like uh, Maya grazing software um, to, to enable them to do that feed budgeting. And you, you need to really know six months in advance, really, how much feed you have and, and look at the stock numbers that you have. So you always have to, to match uh, your stock numbers to your, to your carrying capacity. But uh, given that, um, you also have to be able to, uh, well, you have to actually have to understand something about the physiology of plants and what happens when you graze them and what happens when you leave them and 
all the different growth stages of plants, you know, what happens in the early vegetative stage, the mid vegetative stage, what happens when a plant switches over from being vegetative to reproductive, what happens to its root exudates. So just to like give a very brief overview of that, plants will produce a lot of root exudates in the early growth stages. Once they switch over to reproductive, in other words, if we were talking about a grass plant, for example, once it starts to produce seed or even think about producing seed, it's going to stop producing root exudates and it's going to move all its uh, nutrients from its leaves up into the stems and into the seeds that it's now producing. So the leaves become much lower in nutritional value. They're going to have lower protein. They're going to have lower energy because all of that's going to be transferred into the seed. So in your priority grazing, you're, you're going to select certain paddocks on the farm where you're not going to let that happen. You actually should be getting in there and grazing those plants before they uh, become reproductive. But you don't want to do that year in, year out either because at some stage you do need to let plants reproduce. So the whole, uh, if, I can, if I understand it correctly, of Dick Richardson's uh, grazing naturally is that you sort of divide the farm into something like seven seven sections and one section of that is called the sabbath which you in a 12 or in a in a um in a growing season you don't graze that at all so there's going to be one seventh of the farm basically is going to be not grazed at all to allow all the plants to go to seed and then your priority grazing paddock is going to be the one where every time it looks like they want to go to seed you're going to come back and graze it and you're going to keep putting a lot of pressure on those plants to keep them in the early vegetative stage to make those, to really pump out those root exudates. And then that paddock, that has been your priority paddock, um, next year will become your Sabbath. So you're actually going to move them around. So in seven years, you do a complete rotation of the whole farm and the ones in between get intermediate levels of grazing. And the thing about varying it like that is that once you have some kind of a recipe for grazing, so let's say, for example, you decide you're going to have a um, let's just call it like cell grazing and you're going to divide that. Let's say you divided the property up into, into uh, I don't know, 30 paddocks or something like that. And you said, oh, I'll be in each paddock, you know, for three days. I'm just going to move around being three days in each paddock. You just get into like a recipe approach and over time it doesn't really work. But you have to try and vary the amount of disturbance that paddocks are getting. They have to have sometimes not be disturbed, other times to be disturbed a lot because that's how natural ecosystems work. It's, again, it comes back to that intermediate disturbance hypothesis that um, natural ecosystems respond to chaos in a way, that, it, that they, they don't respond to set routines. Um, so we have to be careful not to, and, and unfortunately in agriculture, we really have come down to just using recipes for everything, recipes for fertilizer application, recipes for pasture composition and um, and it's all right just to let the stock just go out there and graze. We think that, um, you, you know, there has to be a lot more management. The management has to be a lot more focused. We have to be a lot more aware of what happens when a cow or a sheep grazes grass, for example. What does it do to the soil microbiome? How does the plant respond? How do the microbes respond? How soon should we come back in and graze that again? You know, there's, there's a lot of um, information there in actually there's a lot more to the management than what we have invested in management in the past, but we, we invest in management rather than, we've got to get away from investing in inputs. We're using those inputs to replace uh, management. We're using inputs to replace soil function. So we have to uh, invest in learning about management so that we can get away from the inputs and so that we can restore soil function. The only thing that can restore soil function is microbes, but we have to understand how to manage plants to stimulate the microbes. Okay, well, okay. This, um, this kind of segues on this one. Oh, Christine, can I get, oh, good. Um, so this uh, participant says, I'm slowly seeing the good effects of diversity happening on my farm, but I have some paddocks that are a problem. Waterlogging of one paddock seems to be the main problem and compacted sodic prone tea tree lowlands are another. More of a comment than a question, but I guess he's asking for any suggestions, <laughs> I'm assuming. Yeah, well, without without seeing it, I mean, it's hard to know, but, but you know, possibly the area where the tea tree is, like, um, you know, I think, think about things like having pigs or something in there that would get in and dig all around and really create, create some disturbance in areas like that. It would be hard to know what to do with areas that have tea tree in them. Um, it's a pretty good sign that nothing much else will want to grow there. 
So I think you could see quite dramatic changes with, um, with putting pigs into an area like that. And the other one, as far as the waterlogging goes, I mean, obviously there are going to be some low-lying areas that naturally would be, have probably been waterlogged for, you know, thousands of years maybe. Um, it depends whether it's a recent problem or it's something that's been there for hundreds of years. Um, if, it's, if it's an area that should be a swamp, well, it's always going to be a swamp. But if it's waterlogging in an area that wasn't previously a wetland, um, then it's, um, it's a sort of structural problem. And, you know, maybe um, that plant that I mentioned to you, that uh, lotus caniculata, the, oh, you said you couldn't get that. That was bird's foot trefoil is something that just loves wet areas. But I think you said the seed for bird's foot trefoil wasn't available in WA. Uh, so maybe they need to find something that's going to be tolerant to water logging to um, you have to look around and see see what plants were, were available to. If you can actually get something to grow in there, it's going to make a big difference to soil structure. And I can't answer that question really without seeing it. There, there, there are some areas that are going to be waterlogged areas anyway, no matter what you do. Um, uh, here's a question from a dairy farmer. We run a highly productive, profitable dairy farm using rotational grazing. Are you able to recommend a pasture mix for highly productive winter pasture annual rainfall 700 mils, currently using predominantly clover ryegrass mix with a bit of chicory and leafy turnip? From your presentation, it would appear my next step is a diverse pasture. Is this a reasonable assumption? What, what, was the, what were the plants again that he's using? Uh, he's using ryegrass, uh, clover and ryegrass mixed with some chicory and leafy turnip. Okay, so he's not, say he's not saying what kind of clover there it is, but um, so certainly there are some clovers that, like I mentioned, red clover is going to be deeper rooted than white clover. I would definitely put plantain in there because if it's a dairy farm, plantain has been shown to increase milk production. In fact, it can increase milk production by 25% in some cases, having um, say 20% of the, the pasture being plantain. So it might not look like a very productive plant, but it's very high in secondary plant compounds. So the secondary plant compounds that are in plantain and also in chicory uh, improve feed conversion efficiency. So the same amount of dry matter of pasture is going to be converted to more milk. So so many kilograms, for example, per hectare of dry matter is actually going to give you more milk if it's um, things like chicory and plantain compared to that same amount of weight of pasture that's just ryegrass. Uh, so he already has chicory in the mix, which is great. I definitely would be putting some plantain and you could probably even think of some deep rooted things. In fact, this, this will actually come back to the waterlogging question too. Um, I don't know whether you can get the seed in WA, but something like yarrow, uh, which is widely grown in Europe and it's also grown in New Zealand. It's in the Asteraceae family, has very, very deep roots it doesn't matter whether plants eat, uh, whether animals eat it or not. So we also have this other thing that we want pastures to look like a bowling green. We want everything to be grazed right down. Uh, and sometimes on dairy farmers, you'll see farmers come back with a, uh, a tractor or a slasher or something will actually slash pastures after the stock have been in just to make it all look even and uh, <laughs> nice and neat and tidy. Well, that is not what you want. You want your plants to be up and down all over the place, different heights, lots and lots of variety in there and something, and you probably also in a dairy, once you get more diversity in there, I'd be looking at increasing my round length. So I don't know uh, what kind of grazing interval that they're talking about, but a lot of dairy farms are on something like a 21 day round length, which means they'll be coming back to a paddock every 21 days. Um, you need to like, when you get more diversity, you'll be able to extend that and also to take less out at each grade. So you'd look at extending that out to say 40 days or even nudge it up towards 50 if you possibly could. That's going to be a slow process um, as, as you increase diversity and um, as you're moving your animals around to go, to go out from like 21 days to, you know, 30 days to 40 days. And at each graze, only take 50% of the leaf area. So by taking only 50% of the leaf area and increasing um, the, the, the round length, you will actually, you can double the biomass production. And that's been shown. There's no trouble um, to do that. And also the plants will get much deeper roots, which means that you're going to have more tolerance um, to, to hot, dry summers so that there'll be more green over summer as well.
And, and obviously chicory is going to grow well over summer. Um, okay, this is moving away from the, uh, the plants to inputs. Are there inputs that support the soil plant microbiome that can enhance as well as, as, well as animal grazing? Depends, depends what you mean by inputs, but definitely biostimulants are going to be the way of the future. I think biostimulants need to be used in combination with a change in grazing management. They need to be used in combination with uh, pasture diversity. So not just business as usual and then use a biostimulant. So it's part of the package. But a biostimulant is something that stimulates biology, which is why it's called a biostimulant. So a biostimulant could be something like um, a compost extract, which is a cold water extract of compost. It could be a vermi liquid. It could be a protein hydrolysate that farmers make themselves. Um, it could be fermented seaweed. There's a whole lot of things that uh, constitute a biostimulant. And if you were to analyse it using like conventional type analysis and look to see how much phosphorus has it got, how much nitrogen has it got, you know, all the things that farmers would look for in a fertiliser, you would say this has got nothing in it. The standard analysis would basically say there's virtually nothing in here. So how can it possibly work? Um, so what the way that it's working is that it is uh, it's a product that contains biochemical signals from microbes. So let, let's use vermi liquid as an example. Let's say we have a worm farm and we're producing vermi liquid, which is uh, worm tea or worm leachate or whatever you want to call it. So the worms have been processing, the earthworms have been processing uh, a whole lot of organic matter and it's gone through their digestive system. And during that digestion process, it's been exposed to, it's a fermentation medium. So there's lots of lactobacillus in there. There's also uh, fungi and protists and all kinds of amazing microbes in the gut of an earthworm. And everything inside the gut of an earthworm, there's lots and lots of microbes in there. They're all signaling to each other. And that's the chemical signals that the microbes are using to communicate with each other inside the earthworm gut. That means that the vermi cast and also the vermi liquid is going to, is going to contain literally millions of microbial signals. So all you're doing when you're putting that um, cold water product, for example, just a cold water leachate or a a compost uh, extract or something like that that may not appear to have very much in it. It's absolutely full of microbial signals. So the plant um, is going to respond to those signals in the same way as it would respond to having a microbially diverse soil. Because how is a plant going to know whether there's a whole lot of microbes around its roots? The only way that a plant can know there's a whole lot of microbes around its roots is by detecting the signals that the microbes are putting out. So if we just take the signals and put them on the roots or put them on the leaves or put them on the seeds, then the plant is going to sense that there are a whole lot of microbes there when there aren't. So we're mimicking a diverse microbiome by putting the signature of microbes onto plant seeds, for example, or onto plant leaves. And the plant will respond in the same way as it would respond if there was a diverse microbiome. And how does it respond? It responds by producing more exudates. So what we're doing is actually stimulating a plant to produce more exudates to feed the microbes that it senses are there because it has picked up on the signals. So that's how a biostimulant works. So a biostimulant is not the same thing as a biological fertilizer. A biological fertilizer would be something like compost or, um, or something like that that's has a certain amount of nitrogen and phosphorus in it and it's basically it's not a high analysis fertilizer but it's a, a much kinder softer um, biological kind of fertilizer so i make a distinction between a biological fertilizer and a biostimulant a biostimulant is not meant to have any nitrogen or any phosphorus or anything like that in it it's just the biochemical signature of microbial communications and most of those communications come from fermented environments like the gut of an earthworm, uh, the rumen of a cow, or if you've made a fermented compost or fermented seaweed extract or something like that. So fermentation produces huge microbial numbers. So one drop of rumen fluid, for example, one single drop of rumen fluid contains 10,000 times more microbes than there are humans on the planet. 
you know, the number of microbes in those fermentation um, mediums is absolutely incredible. Same in the in the gut of an earthworm, you know, incredible numbers of microbes in there. So what we're doing is just taking the signature of microbes, not the microbes themselves, just the signature of microbes, and we're going to apply that to plant leaves or plant seeds or um, sometimes in furrow, we can put it in the soil um, to actually mimic what would happen in a diverse plant community. So it can replace diversity to some extent, but the biggest bang for the buck we see is when you have diversity and biostimulants and um, adaptive management, like you know, a management, grazing management, where you're really looking at plant growth stages and looking at what's happening to the plant. When you combine all of those things, your animal impact, your grazing management, plant diversity and biostimulants, that's when you really start to see huge improvements in soil function. And I, um, I think we've got time for maybe one more question. Um, this is a little um, different from the others. And we wanted to, uh, to bring profitability back to farmers. Is regenerating the soil enough, although it has great environmental benefits, as a solution to cut operation, uh, operational fertilizer costs? Is there an, another lever to increase profitability in farming? You need to put your speaker on, Christine, your microphone. Sorry, I was just asking, could you just repeat that, the last bit? Yeah. Uh, is regenerating the soil enough as a solution to cut operation or slash fertiliser cost? Is there uh, other levers to increase profitability in farming? Sorry, I didn't, under, I didn't hear the word lever, other, other levers. Um... Yeah, I guess that's that's a very a very broad question, and that's something that um, there, there's a whole lot of things that that obviously you know it's something you, you need to sit down and examine all the costs of running any kind of business, not just a farming a farming business. But I think I think I mean my only comment on that would be that people have assumed in the past that if you reduce inputs that it is going to be low input farming is going to be uh, low production farming. There's been that link has been made between inputs and productivity because if you go back to that, the graph I showed of um, the Irish research with ryegrass, it showed the more nitrogen that you put onto the ryegrass, the more that it grew. So there's that thing that, well, okay, if we just have a monoculture, if you pull that nitrogen out of the system, you're going to go back to that very low base where the, where the ryegrass hardly grows at all. And because our agricultural systems have been low diversity and have relied on high input, we have had, uh, and it would be true, if you had a low diversity system and you pulled out the inputs, you are going to go back to a low production system. So what we have to work out is how, like leverage is a good word. What we have to figure out is how to leverage biological activity to actually give us a situation where you know one plus one does equal five we, we have to figure out how to get symbiotic relationships occurring between uh, the different variables that we're managing it on a farm and and as i said you can't just change one thing and expect that the whole thing is going to to change so that in a grazing situation, for example, you need to look at your grazing management. You need to look at the composition of your pasture. You need to look at what fertilisers you're using and why are you using them. Um, and you, maybe you need to look at some soil disturbance as well. You know, there's a whole lot of, you actually have to understand how to stimulate the soil microbiome to, to increase productivity and to get that synergism. Synergistic is probably the word I, I should be using rather than symbiotic. Sorry, I knew it wasn't quite coming to me. So we need synergistic effects um, to get leverage. In terms of other costs, I can't, I can't really comment on that. Like, you know, you've got your labour costs, your machinery costs and those kinds of things. But there's a, there's a lot of, I mean, if you just take the West Australian, well, again, this is going to be not southwest of Western Australia, but if you look at the wheat belt in Western Australia, over summer, some farmers will be spraying their paddocks two or three times every summer, going out there, spending hours and hours, days probably, on a tractor, using lots of fuel, using lots of poisons to kill everything green that comes up over summer because they've been told you can't have anything green over summer, it's going to 
you know, rob the soil of its moisture and rob the soil of its nutrients and all these things that people are told, you know, that's a huge input cost and a huge time factor. When in fact, if everything green that came up over summer was just left there, you'd have some photosynthesis and it would build some soil. And it's not really an issue for you coming into the next um, uh, cropping phase because whatever grew over summer is not going to grow over winter. You know, it's uh, if they're just annual summer weeds, they're not going to grow in winter time, so they're not going to be able to compete with your crops. So there's many things that we do that are irrelevant. That are we're just spending time and money trying to keep things um, simple. We keep trying to simplify things all the time instead of trying to in increase complexity. And when we can increase complexity, Mother Nature can do a lot of those jobs for us. Well, I think uh, we're out of time. Um, Christine's been, <laughs> she must be exhausted. It's been a long day. <laughs> uh, we did get through most questions. There were just a few that we didn't get to, but um, I think broadly you've probably answered pretty much every one. Um, so once again, absolutely fascinating, um, Christine, and lots of food for thought and, and maybe some opportunities out there for farmers who perhaps to grow um, seed for some of those seeds that we can't get here. Uh, because that's obviously we want to have um, a lot more biodiversity, but we can only get grass seed. <laughs> it makes it a little bit difficult. Uh, so, so that would be an interesting thing to to think about. Um, now, um, I would like to thank actually the audience for uh, putting their hand in their pocket. Uh, I mean, I, I, it's probably less than the, uh, the cost of a um, tank of fuel, but. I know every dollar is precious, um, but we really do appreciate your support in, in enabling us to bring experts like Christine um, into our uh, catchment virtually or otherwise. Um, so thank you very much for that. And just a reminder that I will be sending out a link to the webinar and the presentation next week. So you can all review everything that's been discussed at your leisure. Uh, and also remind you that on our website, um, in the talking after hours section, there is uh, the last webinar and presentation that Christine gave as well. So that's freely available for you to view. Um, and lastly, uh, before I say goodbye to Christine, <laughs> I'd just like everyone to um, stay a bit longer after, after we've said goodbye and um, complete our evaluation. <laughs> I know everybody hates evaluations at the end of things, but for us organisers, they're super beneficial because it helps us understand uh, what you got out of um, a presentation and what you'd like to see in the future. So please hang around after we said goodbye to, so, to fill that out. So uh, without uh, any further ado, I'd like to say thank you once again to the wonderful Christine Jones for her uh, fantastic input. And we hope to see you physically um, <laughs> in WA maybe next year. Thanks again, Christine, and goodbye to everybody. Thank you, Kate, and goodbye, everyone. Um, I've always thoroughly enjoy working with you. You're, you're a great team. So yes, it will be lovely to come to WA next year if the borders are open. Um, but anyway, thank you all and uh, see you next time. Happy <laughs> farming. Right. Yeah, see you next time. <laughs>